Former Lieutenant Governor and longtime power broker Richard Ravitch, he helped rescue New York from bankruptcy back in the 70s. His career spans over the course of five decades, and today he sat down and shared some of the highlights and some of the challenges of that career with our own Richard Brodsky. Thanks, Rich. I spoke today with Richard Ravitch about his long and difficult and successful career and his new memoir, a book called, let's get this right, So Much to Do, A Life of Business Politics and Confronting Fiscal Crises. It's a much better book than its title. <laughs> let's listen in now with my interview with Richard Ravitch earlier today. Uh, Dick, welcome to uh, RNN. I'm pleased to be here. What's the most difficult decision you ever had to make in public life? Uh, when uh, with the governor, and it was really his decision, but it was my advice uh, to threaten the banks with bankruptcy if they didn't do what had to be done in order to keep New York functioning back in the 70s. This was at the big fiscal crisis when you were uh, running UDC. And it well, it, it, we had a similar crisis with UDC. Uh, all the banks were convened one day in the governor's office at my suggestion. I had a bankruptcy petition prepared sitting at the at the desk uh, in front of every uh, what did you bank. Hope, what did you hope to achieve with the bank? They, they had a, refused to lend the money to enable us to finish 20 odd thousand units of affordable housing that were under construction. They wanted us to pay money that was legitimately owed. They were entitled to it. Uh, we said we have to do both at the same time. Uh, they said no. Uh, we didn't pay them the day it was due. They then set off against UDC's bank accounts. I had a bankruptcy petition prepared. The governor was willing to take the risk that... Governor uh, Carey. Governor Carey. Gutsy, so, gutsy, terrific guy. So you helped dig the city and the state out of a looming cash shortfall of Okay, well, avoid, avoided bankruptcy helped, yes. That there were a lot of by, people involved. I wasn't the only one. You did it by beating up the banks. Did you beat up the unions? Yes, absolutely. Who, so who didn't you beat up? We, we beat up everybody. The legislature. We even got upstate Republicans to vote <laughs> for more taxes rather than let our transportation system go to hell and rather than let well, the city go into bankruptcy. What's the lesson for today of those experiences? Well, there is so little civility in politics today. There's so little willingness to comprehend. You threatened the banks and the unions, you just told me. What? But there was but you never. Were, but you were polite about it. There was never the kind of anger that you see uh, today, the kind of vituperation. You never saw. It, it wasn't a period in which the influence of money was this profound but as it is But back then, politics. politics wasn't corrupt. The state and the city weren't corrupt. Isn't that the difference that matters? The quality of the people in politics was a hell of a lot better in those days. Was the government of New York corrupt today? I don't think so. Except to the extent that money's influence in politics... Legal uh, money or illegal money? Legal money. Well, that's an interesting place for public people to, to pause for a moment. If, if you read the editorial pages, the city council, the state legislature, maybe even the mayor and the governor at different times, even though they tend to handle executives differently than they handle legislatures, are corrupt. That's not your experience. Not my experience. What's your experience? It's very unfair characterization. And the amount of rectitude that's expressed about politicians has one serious consequence, and that is it's discouraging young people from trying politics. And the first quote in my book is from Plato, who said that if you're not prepared to engage in politics, you deserve to be governed by inferior people. And the lesson for that today is to ignore what you read in the papers and, and get into the fray anyway? Yes, sir. Absolutely. Um, What's the biggest immediate problem that the city and the state of New York face? Uh, we made a lot of promises uh, at a period of America's greatest hegemony when we saw growth rates and prosperity uh, uh, growing. And we made commitments to our employees, to our citizens. We were going to provide health care. We were going to provide pension benefits. We were going to provide... 
a, a, a decent standard of living uh, to people who were tired, to people who were aging. Um, and the problem is our resources haven't kept pace with our promises. And we're now in a bind. And So uh, what do we do, break the promises? Well, first of all, you have to start off with one fundamental decision about what your values are. You have to decide whether there is a moral equivalency between a promise to pay interest to somebody who lends you money and a promise to pay a benefit to somebody who worked for you for 20 well, years. Well, let me see if I understand that. Often we hear that the most important way to use dollars in an economic crisis for a government is to pay the bondholders. You're saying that's not the most important thing? I, I'm saying that just as is playing out in Detroit right now, everybody has to get something less than what they may be legally entitled to to avoid a total devastation in a community. Would you break the promise made to people who are on retirement? Not separately and apart from a promise to somebody who lent me money. But you'd break the promise to everybody on the on the theory that... The well, I wouldn't break it. I would ask for, and negotiate their consent to take less in exchange for having the entity that we're talking about, be it a city or a state, continue unabated. You're yes, an articulate spokesman for the history and dynamics of these kinds of decisions. But you've written a book. Yep. Um, what's the funniest part of the book? Oh, the funniest part of the book really is a lot of sort of fun stories about Koch, Carey, Moynihan uh, in the old days. Uh, I, I understand that at one point you were asked to negotiate with the head of the teachers union, Al Shanker. Uh, both you and Al Shanker are Jewish, and it turns out that the Irish governor who was asking you to do this had done so on the first night of Passover. Is that is that true? No. Um, <laughs> the, that's a different story. The contract with the subway workers right. expired on the first night of Passover and the mayor and I was at somewhat at odds because the mayor didn't want to pay the transit workers anything and I wanted to settle a contract, rebuild the system, treat them with some degree of decency since they hadn't had a wage increase in a number of years and uh, Governor Carey, eager to avoid a fight between me and the mayor, arranged for a Passover Seder at the Say Regis Hotel <laughs> the night that the contract was expiring. <laughs> the, the matzo ball soup was impeccable? The matzo ball soup was okay. The gefilte fish was terrible. <laughs> a, 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 a review of the cuisine at the St. Regis that will stand the t test of time. Um, uh, it's a very interesting Hugh book. Carey's son was the banquet manager and he and I had lunch the other day, and we still laugh about it. Well, it's a great story. The book is full of great stories, and uh, uh, your career has been an interesting and important one, and uh, your book is an interesting and funny one. Uh, the, the book's name is? So Much to Do, A Life of Politics, Business, and Confronting Fiscal Crises. Well, the lessons of the book are there for all of us, and I hope people buy the book, and I hope they read the book, and I hope in the end you end up encouraging people to get engaged in public life as you did. I'm trying. Thanks so much, Dick. Thank you. First of all, Richard, I'm sure you had to look up vituperation after he was done with the interview, <laughs> but uh, he's, he's a tough guy, but he's a funny guy. I'm curious. I get the vibe he liked the old time more than, I mean... Well, everybody does. It's well, never, I don't I care mean, if you're a baseball fan or a politics fan. It's never as good today as it was But he was wasn't then. sitting on the couch watching the TV. He was there in the room with the Pattersons and the rest when he was also there with the Carries and I, the Cox. I think he believes that during the fiscal crisis of the 70s, there was a, a, a cadre of leadership, be it Ed Koch and Daniel Patrick Moynihan and Hugh Carey and others who rose to the occasion. I think he finds that perhaps over the last 10 years, there's less of that. I don't want to put words in his mouth, and I don't want him to sound nostalgic, but I think there's enough truth in that. Uh, you heard him speak about, yeah. for example, civility in public life, that, it, that it's worth... It, it, the book makes that point brilliantly. It's worth reading. I also got that it wasn't just posturing. That famous headline, a Ford to New York drop dead, um, it was really that touch and go, wasn't it? In the, 70s? It, the, the, the fiscal crisis that he became involved in was a real 
the kind of thing that if it had teetered the wrong way would have had a permanent and crushing effect on New York in ways that it, it's hard to imagine. It looks, in retrospect, obvious and easy how you yeah. solve it. It wasn't. They took some risks. You heard the, some of the stories, and things came out the, the way they should have. Um, he mentioned Detroit in there. Um, he's going to take a role, isn't he? The, um, the bankruptcy judge has asked him to do that. I think his experience is right for that kind of job. Um, it's not going to be easy, but he hasn't backed down from tough things before, and he's not backing down now. And again, whatever, I, I know he's uh, crossed a few paths in this time, and you need to with what he's doing, but the one thing I took away was for his whole life, this guy, yeah, he did some private sex work. For his whole life, he's been doing the grungy, dirty work that you have to do and the tough choices oh, you have to make, and there's something to say He's also a very successful real estate uh, yeah. developer. If you drive down the FDR, you pass uh, on 23rd Street, you pass uh, the, 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 the big building whose name's gone right out of my head um, at 23rd and the FDR yeah, yeah. Uh, that he built and owns. And uh, it's not as though he was not successful in the private sector. He did both and uh, did but it But he well. believes and still does his day in public service. He does, and he does so in ways that are a model for the rest of us. He's a, a career civil servant in the English tradition, not in the way Americans talk about it. And he's shown that it's an honorable, important place to put your energy and time. I'd and be interested. Yeah. Uh, does he cover in the book when he became lieutenant governor, because he, he was so frustrated in that job, my, my sense was. He, he you does. You can see it on his face. Yeah. I mean, you didn't even have to hear him. You could he, see it on his face. Well, he, he, he made a proposal to essentially uh, end the structural debt of the state. And to do that, he proposed a sensible one-time one borrowing. Um, I think both the then Attorney General Cuomo and then Governor uh, David Patterson decided that they um, wouldn't go that way and have left the state as a result in a continuing pattern of increased debt. And I think his, Dick's position is we should be spending what we should be spending, but if you want to spend it, raise the taxes to pay for it so you don't get into Detroit-style deficits. But yes, he does talk about it. Mm -hmm. By the way, Andrew, I think we can nail one more nail into the coffin of Richard's fight that he's not now in the media. Okay, coming up make next, it, make him stop. a Bush and a Clinton could face off in another presidential campaign. Are voters dealing with fatigue, or is the family familiarity a plus? We'll have more on that coming up.